It was May 30th, 1908, and Captain W.H. Bartlett, 2nd Officer Joseph Austin's Gray, and their crew were embarking on what seemed to be a routine journey aboard the Tresco. This humble cargo steamer had just set sail from Philadelphia only two days prior. Now, these men were no strangers to the sea's unpredictability, but what was about to unfold was something straight out of a mariner's darkest nightmares. They found themselves around 90 miles off the Cape of Hatteras, North Carolina, a point in their journey where the sea usually whispers familiar tales. But the sea had a different story that day, far from anything they could have anticipated. So imagine this, you're out there in the open ocean, the waves lapping against the hole, the taste of salt in the air, when something suddenly doesn't feel right. The crew sees an unordinary sight that would make any experienced sailor's blood run cold, because in the frothing waves, they witness not one, but over 30, this isn't 30, over 30 sharks that are are clearly being chased and hunted by something. Now, let me ask you, what could be powerful enough and audacious enough to hunt sharks? But as they watched in both awe and terror, they see a massive hump break the surface of the water, something so large that it made the sharks look like minnows in comparison. It was a creature of such monstrous proportions that it defied belief. The scene before them was clear. Whatever this was, it was not just challenging a single shark, but an entire frenzy of them. And then, as if the sight of this behemoth wasn't enough, a colossal head and neck emerged from the depths, confirming their darkest fears. They were sharing these waters with a true sea creature, something so large and terrifying that it made their encounter something that would be forever etched in their minds. And trust me, when you're out there on the open sea, the last thing you want to come across cross is something like that. Now brace yourself because what comes next would make the hair on the back of any seasoned seaman's neck stand on end. It, Captain Bartlett, 2nd Officer Gray, and the crew all got an up and close look at this leviathan that had come from the abyss. This thing wasn't just large, this thing was enormous. Easily over 100 feet in length, its body as thick as the stone pillars of a grand cathedral. It was a sight that seemed to have swum straight out of the pages of ancient Chinese mythology and into their very reality. Second Officer Gray began documenting the encounter as the men observed this beast. His report, while sounding like something out of a Jules Verne novel, was chillingly real. He described the creature's head as unspeakably loathsome, about five feet long from the nose to the top, a sight that no sailor, however, however experienced would ever be prepared for. It had this pouch under its jaw, a skin that drooped like some grotesque caricature of an old man's jowls. The snout of this beast was upturned, curved almost, with no visible nostrils or blowholes. The lower jaw jutted out with the lower lip half projecting half pendulous. Now something was dripping from its lower jaw as if the sight wasn't revolting enough. It was saliva, a dirty drab color that only added to the horror of the situation. Though the creature had no visible teeth, it sported molars as long and menacing as walrus's tusks. But perhaps what was most terrifying were its eyes, a haunting reddish color elongated vertically, and they glowed with a baleful light. It was as if they held the embodiment of the fierce, menacing spirit that powered this thing. This wasn't just an encounter with a sea creature, it was a face-to-face -face experience with a true nightmare of the deep. Now, fortunately for Captain Bartlett, 2nd Officer Gray, and the rest of the crew aboard the Tresco, this oceanic titan seemed to have had its fill of shark chasing for the day. Then, with a motion that could only be described as dismissive, it sent a powerful wave towards the ship, rocking the vessel in a way that defied the regular rhythm of the sea. It was as if this beast was issuing a clear warning. This is my territory. Venture 
no further. Now, heeding this silent yet powerful resonant message, the crew quickly navigated their ship away from the path of this thing, and honestly, who could blame them? Who would want to stick around and test the patience of something like this? Now, let's fast forward to 1916 because this is not where our story ends. In that year, a man named Erwin J. O'Malley unveiled something that could shed some light on the identity of our monstrous friend. While on a holiday trip to the Yangtze Gorges, O'Malley and his wife had a chance encounter with Mr. M. Hewlett, the British Council at Ai Chang, and his wife, and together they set off to explore the cliffs and caves of the Ai Chang Gorge. Now, in one of these caves, located on the right bank of the river and about a mile above the customs station at Pingshong Pa, they stumbled upon a fascinating discovery. Fossils. Now, these weren't your everyday fossils. Instead, these were remnants of an ancient creature of enormous proportions, its origins shrouded in mystery. But according to the local Chinese folklore, the cave was said to stretch for about 20 miles, give or take, all the way to a point near Ai Chang. Could this have been the lair of a creature akin to the one that Captain Bartlett and his crew had encountered? According to local reports, a group from HMS Snipe had ventured into this same cave years earlier, and they spent three days in the cave, yet they couldn't reach the end despite their efforts. Instead, evidence of their journey was found deep within the cave. The name of their ship painted boldly on the walls, a beacon of their exploration that went far beyond where O'Malley and his group found the fossils. The cave, known to the locals as Shen Kan Su, translates to the Holy Shrine. Now, interestingly enough, one of the characters used in the name is the Chinese symbol for dragon. Now, right at the entrance of a massive rock formation stands guard, and just a few yards behind it, you'll find a particular piece of curved rock. It bears a slight resemblance to a part of a dragon's body. While this similarity might be lost on foreign visitors, Visitors, it resonated very strongly with the Chinese locals. Now you have to wonder, could there truly be a connection between the dragon-like creature that Captain Bartlett and his crew encountered and the dragon's symbolism in this cave? Could they have crossed paths with a creature straight out of ancient Chinese legends? Or was it all just a bizarre coincidence? Now as O'Malley and his group would venture deeper into the cave, they found themselves walking along an unusual ridge trying to steer clear of a pool of water surrounding it. This ridge was no ordinary landform. Instead, it was curved and twisted, much like a serpentine body. The resemblance was so uncanny that they lowered their lamps to get a closer look. And wouldn't you know it? They were walking on a fossil, the remains of an enormous reptile that seemed frozen in time. But the story doesn't end there, and upon closer inspection, they discover not just one, not two, not three, but six or eight of these colossal beasts, their remains scattered across the cavern floor. The group hastily collected a few small loose pieces of scale, promising to return the next morning for a more thorough examination and return they did. They chose one of the largest fossils for their study, a specimen mostly isolated from the rest. And this one, well, it was a whopper. The part they could identify measured an impressive 70 feet. But that wasn't all. As far as they could tell, this fossil seemed to continue for another 60 to 70 feet. The exact length, however, was hard to ascertain due to the interlaced coils of the reptilian fossils. The depth of the visible part of the body was about two feet, and it seemed to have a large flat head, somewhat similar to that of a Morosaurus compari. So, Let's pause for a moment and think about this. Here, we have a report of an encounter with a sea monster that could very well be a leviathan or a dragon, and then we have this mysterious cave filled with fossils of gigantic reptiles. Could it be possible that the terrifying creature that Captain Bartlett and his entire crew encountered was a living remnant of these ancient beasts, or perhaps cousins of some kind? Now, about 12 to 14 feet from the head of the fossil, the group found what appeared to be partially uncovered legs, and then again, about 50 feet from the head. 
Interestingly, this cave had been explored in the past, with people going even further than where O'Malley and his group found the fossils. Now, this suggests that these fossils might have been recently uncovered, perhaps by a surge of water coursing through the cave. The theory is that these behemoths were trapped in the cave by volcanic activity and starved to death. This could explain the discrepancy between the size of their bodies and their incredible length. Now, here's something that'll really make you think. These fossils bore an uncanny resemblance to the Chinese dragon, which has led some to speculate that the Chinese dragon mythology might not be borrowed from Western mythology, as was previously thought. Instead, it could be based on actual creatures that once from the land. Now, the discovery of these fossils caused quite a stir among the local Chinese population and foreigners, with people flocking to see them at the time daily. O'Malley was even trying to get the Chinese authorities and the Chinese Monument Society involved to protect these remarkable specimens from danger. In fact, a Richard Freeman, a notable figure in the field, theorized that these fossils could be the remains of a dinosaur species native to only China, more commonly known as the Mementusaurus. Given O'Malley's description of the fossils resembling a Chinese dragon, Freeman was led to consider an extraordinary idea. What what if dragons weren't just the stuff of myths and legends? What if they were real monsters that once roamed the world? And this thought inevitably led Freeman to his personal views on sea dragons, creatures said to spend a significant amount of time in ocean waters. He began his career as a zoologist, a solid foundation. But it was cryptozoology that truly sparked his passion. And within the cryptic world of unknown creatures, one species had fascinated him more than any other. Dragons. Yet something always puzzled him. For over a century, no one had thought to publish a definitive nonfiction book on these mythical creatures. So, as a qualified zoologist, he thought, why not me? Now, this isn't just some armchair theorist. He's crisscrossed the globe in search of these enigmatic beasts, exploring the wilderness of Gambia, trekking through Mongolia, navigating the thick jungles of Thailand, and even digging into the old legends right at home in England. And one thing became abundantly clear. There isn't just one answer to what dragons are or what they might be. Now, in his words, numerous creatures have become intertwined with the lore and legend of what we perceive and view as dragons today. Of course, these creatures are distinctly different from one another, but that should not detract from the fact that dragons are a real phenomenon. After poring over numerous ancient reports of dragon sightings, he's come to a compelling conclusion. He's certain that many of these accounts were real encounters dating back two or three hundred years or even further. But what the witnesses weren't seeing, the fantastical fire-breathing beast of lore. Instead, he believes they were likely encountering massive snakes, gigantic crocodiles, and the Australian monster lizard, known more commonly as the Mangalania. The mere mention of dragons often paints a picture of fire-breathing behemoths in our own minds. I mean, certain accounts fit this description. However, if you delve into many of the earliest and most ancient legends, you'll find that dragons are more frequently associated with water, not fire. So, he proposes that some of the more credible lake monster tales from yesteryears might have been the fuel for these dragon stories. He believes some classic dragon tales from medieval England, including tales of creatures like the Lambton Worm, probably originated from accounts of lake monsters, giant eels, etc. Over time, these stories might have morphed into narratives about dragons running amok. The crucial thing to remember here is that these tales should not undermine the fact that people did indeed see something out of the ordinary. He would go as far as to stake his life on the existence of Megalania, or at least its recent existence in the expansive forest and lagoons of Australia and the wilds of New Guinea. I mean, after all, the Megalania was an enormous beast, a giant monitor lizard that could grow well beyond 30 feet. That's pretty much a flipping dinosaur. And in the most literal sense, this creature embodied a classical dragon. Now, to segue to the next part, a F.W. Kemp, who was a military officer from the UK, had a bone-chilling encounter with his wife in 1932 that would be cemented in the annals of the cryptid sightings. Now, their terrifying encounter with the unknown was meticulously penned down by Kemp himself, securing its place in history. And indeed, this story has been preserved 
for us here. It goes like this. On August 10th, 1932, I found myself with my wife and son on Chatham Island nestled in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And suddenly, my wife drew my attention to something extraordinary moving through the channel between Strong Tide Island and Chatham Island my bewilderment was immeasurable as I beheld a colossal creature, its head breaching the water surface, moving against the tide at about four miles per hour. The displacement it caused was so significant that it kicked up quite a wash on the rocks, leading me to believe that this was more of a reptilian entity rather than a winding one, given the extent of the disturbance it created. The channel at this particular point measures around 500 yards in width. The creature swam towards the the sheer rocks of the opposite island and, in a sudden, swift motion, thrust its head out of the water onto the rock. Moving its head side to side, it looked like it was taking its bearings, acclimating to its surroundings. Then, fold after fold, its massive body surfaced, revealing a serrated tail end with what seemed like a flail-like appendage moving at its tip. Its movements mirrored those of a crocodile. Around its head was what appeared to be a mane flowing around around its body like floating seaweed. The creature's presence seemed to shift the whole landscape, making it challenging to describe what I was experiencing. It felt as if this entity didn't belong to the present world, but was a relic from a time long past when the world was still young. The creature's moment on the rock was fleeting. My wife and 16-year-old son darted towards a land point, hoping for a better view. The noise they made? I believe disturbed the beast. With the sea being incredibly calm, it seemed to easily slip back into the deep water. There was a tumultuous stir beneath the surface, and in a blink, the creature vanished without a trace. In my estimation, this creature's speed must be breathtaking, and its senses of smell, sight, and hearing honed to an extraordinary degree. However, capturing it on film would be incredibly challenging, given that its movements are unlike anything I've ever heard. My guess would place its length at no less than 80 feet. Some logs on Strong Tide Island gave me a point of reference for the monster's size as it moved past them. The following day, I measured one log over 60 feet in length, and the creature had significantly overlapped it at both ends. I placed a newspaper where the creature had rested its head, then took an observation from our earlier viewing point. The animal's head was substantially larger than the double sheet of the newspaper. Its body must have been at least five feet thick and exhibited a bluish-green hue that shone in the sunlight like polished aluminum. As for the shape of the head, I couldn't quite make it out, but it was noticeable thicker than the rest of the body. In the quiet town of Port Charlotte, Florida, nestled on the Gulf of Mexico, lived a 32-year-old woman by the name of Rebecca. Now, Rebecca was an experienced scuba diver, having spent the better part of her last decade exploring the underwater world. She saw no stranger to the mysteries of the deep, having encountered all manner of sea creatures in her diving experience. But one particular dive would forever change her perception of the ocean, because on a calm day with the waters at the perfect temperature, Rebecca embarked on another one of her diving adventures. She donned her scuba gear and prepared herself for the dive, and as she descended into the depths, she marveled at the vibrant coral life and sea life all around her. But roughly at about 100 feet down, she noticed a dark spot in the water. It wasn't oil or debris, it was something much larger. And as she approached, she realized that the dark matter was the size of a ship and almost round. Its skin was so dark it was almost like a massive shadow. And so, out of curiosity, not something I would do, she reaches out to try and touch it. And as she did, strange holes began to open up on its body and what she would describe looked like little eyes popping out and appearing. Larger eyes opening further up on its body, paralyzing her with fear, and she could feel her heart rate spiking and her breathing increasing. And suddenly, this thing enclosed in on her, where it seemed to disappear entirely, almost changing its form or color and blending in with the floor around it. That's when Rebecca felt a shift in the water and a sudden pull downward. Now, she tried to swim away, but she found herself sinking further, and she was shot upward until she was about 100 feet from the surface. A 
and looking down, she could see the dark figure reappearing just before fading from sight. She managed to calm herself down and slowly swam back to the surface. Now, the rest of her trip out there was pretty uneventful, but she could not shake off the encounter she had had. She had no idea what it was, and her attempts to find similar experiences or explanations proved fruitless. Now, while we're on the topic of sea monsters, let's discuss mermaids. Now, most people don't realize that mermaid is actually a blend of two words. The first is mer, and an old English term that translates to sea, and of course, maid, as we all know, refers to a young woman or girl. Now, the stories of old depict using these mermaids, trying to use their voices to weave enchanting hypnotic songs, luring sailors to join them in the murky depths below. But the intention behind this seduction was far from benign. Their goal? To distract the sailors from their duties, leading their ships to crash disastrously upon rocky shores. The mermaids, it seems, had a taste for death. There are also tales of mermaids unintentionally squeezing the life out of drowning men in their misguided attempts at rescue. It's said that these mermaids had a peculiar fondness for whisking humans away to their underwater domains. In fact, Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid suggests that these sea maidens often forget that humans can't breathe underwater. Other legends hint at a more evil intent, alleging that these aquatic she-creatures deliberately drown men out of pure, venomous spite. Thus, mermaids have always been seen as a paradox, sometimes friendly, sometimes fatal. The legendary sirens of Greek mythology, often depicted as mermaid-like figures in folklore, are one such example of these aquatic enchantresses. Other mythical beings that share a similar narrative include water nymphs and silkies, creatures known to morph from seals into humans and vice versa. Now, in British folklore, mermaids were considered harbingers of misfortune, sometimes predicting disasters, other times maliciously causing them. To illustrate this, variations of the ballad Sir Patrick Spens depict a mermaid delivering ominous messages to doomed ships. In some versions, she declares that the crew will never see land again. In others, she deceitfully assures them they're close to shore, a proclamation the seamen shrewdly recognize as a wicked lie. The origins of this ballad trace back to Scotland, possibly referring to an actual historical event, the maritime journey of the Scottish Queen Margaret, the maid of Norway across the treacherous North Sea in 1290. There's also speculation that the ballad might refer to a voyage undertaken by the princess's mother in 1281. But regardless of the actual event behind the ballad, the lyrics testify to the long-standing awareness and fear of mermaids within the British Isles, echoing throughout the countless centuries. Now, in the quaint English village of Childs or Call, a mermaid lived in a small pond, and in 1893, the tale was documented by writer Robert Charles Hope, who would recount the chilling encounter like this. Once, so long ago, well before my time, perhaps a hundred years or more, there was a sighting of a mermaid. It was early morning, just as the sun was rising, and two men were headed to work when they stumbled upon a sight that left them frozen. They stood at the pond's edge, eyes wide, staring at something floating atop the water that filled them with unspeakable dread. They feared they were about to be snatched up and delivered to the devil himself. Unfortunately, I can't describe what they saw as I wasn't present, but it was a mermaid, the same kind you'd read about in the newspapers. At first, the men were ready to flee, their hearts pounding with terror, but then the mermaid spoke. Her voice was like a melody so soothing and captivating that their fear melted away. Both men fell under her spell in an instant. She spun a tale of a hidden treasure nestled at the bottom of the pond, chunks of gold and who knows what other riches. She promised to give them all they desired if they would just join her in the water and accept the treasure from her hands. So they waded into the water, almost up to their chins, and watched as she dove beneath the surface, returning with a chunk of gold nearly as large as a man's head. As they reached out to take the treasure, one man exclaimed, Well, I'll be damned if this isn't the luckiest day. But to their astonishment, the mermaid snatched the gold away, letting out an ear-piercing scream and disappearing back into the depths of the pond. They never saw her again and never got a piece of her gold. And since then, there has been no sighting of her it's believed that the man's casual swearing spooked
evoked the elusive creature, leading her to vanish. Now from there, our journey takes us to Mermaid's Pool, also known as Blakemere Pool, located in the village of Thorncliffe in Staffordshire, England. Now this mysterious body of water nestled among the forest, lakes, rolling hills, and crags of the Staffordshire moorlands carries a tale that goes back an estimated 1,000 years. Lisa Dowley, a dedicated investigator of this legend, has spent countless hours separating fact from fiction, and she shares that the story suggests that this mermaid was once a beautiful maiden who was persecuted and accused of various crimes by a man by the name of Joshua Lynette. Now, it's unclear whether the charges involved witchcraft or if she had perhaps rejected his romantic advances. Mr. Lynette had this woman bound and tossed into the bottomless Blackmere pool. As she struggled for air, the woman cried out a curse against her accuser, vowing that her spirit would forever haunt the pool. She swore that she would one day pull Joshua Lynette beneath the dark waters of Blakemere Pool to meet his doom. Now, believe it or not, Joshua Lynette was discovered lifeless only three days later, face down in the same Blakemere Pool. By the way, guys, it is Blakemere, so hopefully I haven't said Blackmere. When the local folks pulled his body from the water and flipped it over, they were met with a horrifying sight. What was once his face had been reduced to a ragged mess of flesh, seemingly torn apart by sharp claws or talons. Aqualate Mere, located just a stone's throw away from the town of Newport in Shropshire, England, and right over the border from the pastoral landscapes of Staffordshire, at roughly one and a half kilometers long and a half kilometer wide, Aqualate Mere stands as the largest natural lake in the Midlands, although it's surprisingly shallow, barely reaching three feet deep. Now, a tale passed down through generations recounts an incident many, many years ago. As the mirror was being cleaned, a mermaid suddenly burst from the water, causing the workmen to recoil in sheer terror. Along with her shocking appearance, she let out a series of chilling, condemning threats vowing to destroy the town of Newport if any efforts were made to drain the precious waters of Aqualet Mere. It seems the town folk took her warning to heart because to this day, no attempts have ever been made to drain it. Now, back in 1797, this schoolmaster by the name of Mr. Monroe lived in Thurso, and one day he claimed to have seen something mind-blowing. Near Sandside Head in the parish of Ray, he spotted a figure that looked like a naked woman sitting on a rock that jutted out into the sea. Now, this wasn't just any woman. Her head was covered in long, thick, light brown hair that flowed down her shoulders. She had a round forehead, a plump face, and rosy cheeks. Her mouth and lips looked just like a human's, and her eyes were the striking shade of blue. But here's where it gets really strange. Her arms, fingers, chest, and stomach were all as big as a fully grown woman's, and she seemed to be combing her hair with her fingers. Now, Mr. Monroe said it looked like she was enjoying herself, and she kept at it for a few few minutes before she just dropped into the ocean. Now, Mr. Monroe was convinced that he saw some kind of marine animal that looked human. If it hadn't been for the fact that it was hanging out in such a dangerous spot, then disappearing into the waves, he might have thought it was just a regular woman. Now, here's the kicker. 12 years later, other people reported seeing something similar near the same spot. They also thought it was a mermaid. Now, believe it or not, there's this striking account that Dr. Robert Hamilton shares in his book, an account for which he vouches, given his acquaintance with some of the individuals involved in the incident. The year was 1823, and rumors began circulating about some fishermen from Yell, one of the Shetland Islands who had reportedly ensnared a mermaid in their own fishing lines. The creatures they described was about three feet long, with the upper portion of its body bearing an uncanny resemblance to a human, even showcasing protruding features akin to a woman's chest. Its face face, forehead, and neck were short, more akin to those of a monkey. It had small arms, which it kept folded across its chest, and its fingers were separate not webbed. The creature had a few stiff, long bristles on top of its head that extended down to its shoulders, and it could raise and lower these bristles at will, almost like a crest. The lower half of its body was reminiscent of a fish. Its skin was smooth, a gray color. The creature did not resist or attempt to bite. Instead, it made a low, sad sound. But are you ready for this? The crew, composed of six men, pulled the creature onto the boat, but eventually, 
their superstition overpower their curiosity, they painstakingly untangled it from the lines and a hook that had inadvertently lodged into its body, and they released it back into the ocean. The creature dove immediately, descending straight down into the depths. Now, Mr. Edmonston, who was the first to narrate this incident, was described by Dr. Hamilton as a well-known and intelligent observer. In a letter to the professor of natural history at the University of Edinburgh, Edmonston included additional details he had learned from the boat's skipper and on one of the crew members. Now, according to them, the creature was in their boat for about three hours in total. Its body was smooth, lacking scales or hair, and had a silvery gray color on top while being white underneath, much like human skin. No gills or fins were noted on its back or belly. Its tail resembled that of a dogfish, and its chest features were about the size of a woman's. Its mouth and lips were very distinct and surprisingly human-like. Now, all six men were fully convinced they had encountered a real-life mermaid, and it's not like they were scared. To fishermen, a mermaid isn't a terrifying entity, but rather a welcome guest, and the only fear they might have had is if the mermaid is treated poorly. Edmonston concluded by noting the usual skeptical argument that seals or other sea creatures might be misidentified under certain desperate circumstances, creating some sort of optical illusion, simply couldn't apply. It's just impossible that six Shetland fishermen could mistake such a mistake, and especially that close. It's worth noting that the Shetland Isles are a mere 158 miles from the Orkney Islands. Now, it's worth noting that the Shetland Isles are actually only a mere 158 miles away from the Orkney Islands, which is a place all on its own known for its strange events and things in the 1800s. So this incident suggests nothing less than the enduring existence of strange, unidentified creatures in the region alone. Now, the story comes from the year of 1808 and the island of Stronza. The reports tell of a creature seen whole and measured by reliable individuals, and this thing was 56 feet long and 12 feet around. The head was tiny, less than a foot from the snout to the first vertebra, and it had a slender neck that stretched out for about 15 feet and all those who saw it agreed it had blowholes, though they couldn't agree on the exact location of these holes. Again, I don't know how that's possible. Starting at the shoulders, something akin to a bristly mane extended almost to the tail's tip. The creature had three pairs of fins, or paws, attached to its body. The front pair were the largest, measuring more than four feet in length, and their tips looked like toes partially webbed. Its skin was smooth and grayish, and its eyes were about the size of a seal's. When the rotting carcass was eventually torn apart by the waves, parts of it were collected, such as the skull and the upper bones of the swimming paws. Now, Mr. Lang, who was a local landowner, secured these and some of the vertebrae. They were preserved and placed in the Royal University Museum in Edinburgh and the Museum of the Royal College of Surgeons in London. Now, lastly, let me introduce you to George Scott. Scott Douglas, who penned classics such as Scottish fairy and folk tales and new border tales. Now, this guy had a deep-seated fascination for the enigmas of the deep sea, especially mermaids, and even more intriguingly, mermen. Douglas spun many captivating tales of mermaids and mermen, particularly from Shetland Isles of Scotland. Now, in his narratives, he'd often describe an undersea realm where a unique kind of atmosphere existed, adapted to support beings that bore a striking resemblance to humans. These creatures were described as breathtakingly beautiful, possessing limited supernatural abilities, and like us, susceptible to death. According to Douglas, these beings resided in vast territories deep under the sea, far beneath where fishes roam. Over their world, the sea rolled loftily, much like the cloudy canopy of our sky. They dwelled in structures made from the pearls and coral of the ocean, and here's where it gets even more fascinating. These beings had lungs, but they were not made for breathing water. They were designed like ours, meant for air. But you might be wondering how they could traverse the great volume of water, separating their undersea world from our own. Well, 
Douglas had this wild explanation for that too, because he proposed that these beings had an extraordinary power that allowed them to take on the skin of certain sea creatures. In other words, they could possess these animals using their bodies as vessels to navigate the ocean at great depths. He even shared some insights that might be startling for those of you who only have a passing knowledge of the merman and mermaid lore. I mean, most people imagine these creatures as, you know, half human or half fish from the waist up, fish from the waist down, but Douglas spun a very different yarn because he claimed that these marine beings preferred taking on the form of the larger seal. Yes, seals. And due to their amphibious nature, these beings could live in the ocean and come ashore, perching themselves on some rock. Here, they'd often shed their sea dress, morph back into their original form, and spend time curiously exploring the world of humans. Here's the catch, and no pun intended. Douglas maintained that each merman or mermaid only possessed a single sea skin that allowed them to navigate the ocean. So if they lose this aquatic attire during a terrestrial expedition, they're stuck. The poor creature would be forced to become a permanent resident of our land world with no hope of returning to their underwater home. And Douglas wasn't just a storyteller, he was a lore keeper, a collector of captivating tales, many of which described encounters from the old world with what appeared to be real living, breathing entities that were supposedly half man, half fish, Sounds wild though, doesn't it? So now imagine a crew of men on a boat stopping at one of the crags for a little seal hunt. They successfully stun several seals, stripping them of their skins, leaving the bodies behind on the rocks. And they're about to make their way back to the shore of Papa Stour when suddenly a monstrous swell rises. Everyone scrambles for the boat, but one man lags. His mates try to save him, but the waves grow too fierce and they're forced to leave their comrade stranded on the scaries. Imagine being that man left alone on a rocky outcrop facing a stormy night with the relentless sea threatening to wash over the rocks. He's looking at a grim fate, either freezing or starving to death, or worse, being swept away by the raging sea. But then he spots something extraordinary. The seals that had managed to flee from the boatmen return, shedding their skins and transform into what looks like oceanic humans, essentially the sons and daughters of the deep sea. These transformed beings then turn their attention to their fallen friends, those stunned by the boatmen and stripped of their skins. Once they come to, the flayed animals transform into mermen and mermaids. They then start to lament, singing this mournful tune that merges with the storm surrounding them. They're grieving the loss of their sea dress, their seal skins, which they need to return to their underwater homes, their coral castles beneath the deep blue of the Atlantic. Their sorrow is particularly particularly deep for one named Olavitness, the son of Gioga. He's been stripped of his seal skin and they know this means he's doomed. He'll never be able to return to the sea and his comrades. He's now an outcast forever trapped in the world above sea. But then, Amidst this sorrowful scene, they notice the stranded man. He's shivering, looking at the wild waves crashing over the stack with utter despair, and here's where things take a very interesting turn. Gioga, seeing the man's dire situation, comes up with a plan that could help her son. She approaches the man, offering to carry him safely across the sea, but there's a condition. She wants the seal skin of Olavitness in return. So they strike a deal. Gioga dons her seal skin outfit, but the Shetlander looking out of the stormy sea he's about to cross wisely asks for a bit of safety measure. He wants to cut a few holes in her shoulders and flanks. This way he can get a better grip between the skin and the flesh of his hands and feet. Gioga agrees to it, and so the man holds onto the neck of the seal and trusting his life to her, and she does not let him down. She carries him to the roaring sea and lands him safely at Acres Geo and Papa Stewart. Now from there he quickly heads to Ham Nouveau, where the seal skin is kept, and true to his word, he gives it to Gioga, the skin giving her son a chance to return to the underwater world covered by the green blanket of the sea. Or so the story goes, of course. But my question for all of you guys is, don't these stories have to start somewhere? I mean, this can't all be originated by bored sailors and seamen, right? I mean, even if we look back at some of the stories I've told you guys today, a lot of these old tales were supposedly documented and witnessed by 
quite pretty reputable eyewitnesses of the time. So that's why I want to ask you guys, what do you all think? Let me know down in the comments below. I'd love to hear from all of you. And of course, if you're a fan of storytelling and the mysterious and supernatural, and you just like long form videos like this one, smack that like and subscribe button for more. Because as always, I love you all. Keep an open mind and I'll see you guys in the very next video.